In our journey through this letter of 1 Timothy, we come to what is a notoriously challenging section within the letter. Uh, the sermon that I preached on this section I called Redeemed Gender Roles. This whole topic of gender is obviously a very big one in our world at the moment. It's a very important section for us to think through. If you haven't already done so, I really do encourage you to go and read this passage just a few times yourself. Try and make sense of some of what you see in the passage. Spend some time praying. Pray that God would help you to understand his word, that he would open your eyes to see his truth. And as we come to this section within the letter, I think one of the most important things for anyone coming to this passage needs to hold on to is what is called context. If you read this section and try and understand it out of its context, then you're going to get yourself into trouble. We have to understand uh, what Timothy, what Paul was writing to Timothy for, uh, what was the focus of this letter, and then this section starts to make a whole lot more sense if we understand it within its context. And so some of what we see within the context is uh, Paul is writing to Timothy because false teaching and false teachers were coming into this church, and Paul wanted this church to keep the, the message of salvation through our Lord Jesus as central in everything this church was doing. So chapter 1 verse 15 is a very important verse. Just remember Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 where we see that God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So Paul wants Timothy to keep leading this church with that at the focus, at the, the center of everything that they're doing. God our Savior wants all people to be saved. So salvation is central in everything that Paul says in this, this uh, letter and then in this section. And just something else that's very important to keep in mind is what we see Paul telling uh, Timothy in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, where he's, he says that what he's writing is so that they may understand how to conduct themselves within the household, which is the church of God, the foundation and pillar of the truth. So he's talking here specifically within the church. And most particularly between, within the church when they gather. So these gender roles that we see are, are not gender roles within business or society in general. Um, they are focused on the roles within the church. So with all that preamble, which is very important for us to get our heads around, we see that Paul starts by saying, therefore, and whenever you see that word, therefore, you need to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? And it's pointing us back. It's reminding us that this flows out of the argument that Paul has been making up to this point. And then within this argument, Paul addresses men and women. So some sort of structure, it's very much verse 8, and then a big section, which could be a split between verse 10 and 11. But verse 8 is focusing in, speaking to men in general, and then from verse 9, Paul is addressing women in general. When we get to the beginning of chapter 3, we'll see that Paul again addresses, addresses men, and he, he's speaking to specific men, a very small subset of men at the beginning of chapter 3, those who, whose task is the, the leading and the, the preaching within the church. But here he starts by saying, I want the men, this is men in general, I want the men everywhere to pray. And what is the prayer that they are meant to be doing? Well, if you remember back to chapter 2, verse 2, it was a call for um, the church to be praying for all people, for kings and all in authority, that they may uh, ultimately be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So this is prayer for the evangelization of the world, praying that God would indeed save sinners. And Paul is saying, I want men to lift their hands, their holy hands, without anger or disputing, because sadly, many men in our world are characterized by anger and disputing, 
They lift their hands in anger against each other, in anger against women. And Paul is saying, no, that's not what you should be like, men. Lift your holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. And so what Paul is saying here to the men is men lead, lead in prayer. Man up and lead in prayer. Lead in prayer, lead in the way that you, you uh, live, not with anger and disputing, but if we again look back to chapter 2, uh, verse 2, or verse 1 and 2, where we should live peaceful and quiet lives. And he's calling the men to lead in this. It's when we get to this bigger chunk of the section where Paul's addressing women that our gender uh, sensitive world, uh, our confused world when it comes to gender, um, there's so much distortion in our society around this that uh, many start to squirm. But I think, again, if we read this section within its context, that Paul is talking about um, the salvation of all people and the church living lives that commend that truth, point people to Jesus the Savior, then this whole section makes a whole lot more sense. And before we dig into the ladies and men sec- or the ladies section, it is important just to remember um, verse 13 and 14 here. Paul links his argument in a creation order. So Paul isn't addressing just some specific uh, problem that was happening in Timothy's church in Ephesus. He's actually addressing something that's been a problem since the very beginning when sin entered the world and the roles of men and female were reversed. And Paul wants the restored, redeemed order of creation, a good order to be displayed in the church. And we should show the beauty of our salvation by displaying that order with men and women embracing their God-given roles within the church. And so Paul says to the woman, I want women to dress modestly. Modestly there is uh, the key word in many ways um, in this, this short section about modesty and good deeds all in worship to God. So women don't dress in a way that is putting the spotlight on you. So not with elaborate hairstyles and gold and pearls and expensive clothing, but rather Dress in a way that is modest, um, pointing away from you. And ultimately, our lives should be ones that are are pointing to God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. And so Paul is talking to the ladies and saying, stop dressing up to look great. Uh, Actually, rather clothe yourselves, adorn yourself with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So he's saying to the ladies, the way you live should... um, Point people to God, your Savior. Uh, He used this word propriety um, twice in this section. Uh, Propriety is is very much just saying, do what's right. Uh, Conform um, to a right way of living as you you live in the society around you. And our world of feminism and women's liberation and girl power really doesn't like to hear what Paul is saying here. But within the church, what Paul is saying here is for the good of the church. It's so that we might indeed live lives that um, commend the gospel to a watching world. Verse 11 and 12 are where uh, much of the debate and discussion happens, where Paul says she must learn in quietness. He uses quietness um, again there. Now, again, as I said, context is so important. So this quietness that he speaks about is, again, he mentioned it in chapter 2. Paul said that we should all pray that we would live quiet lives. And that is lives that commend the gospel rather than commending ourselves. And so Paul is saying to the ladies here, when he says quiet, he's not saying that they never say a thing. It's not silence, but it's lives that aren't um, pushy and loud in in an ugly way. But the very specific thing that he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume. So that is a bad translation. Um, It shouldn't be assume. It should be more like um, exercise authority. 
A woman shouldn't teach or exercise authority over a man. And this is where the discussion has uh, raged uh, for so long. So can women teach within the gathered church? And I think if we keep uh, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 in mind, and we just do a plain reading of verse 11 and 12, the, the plain, easy, simple answer is actually no. Within the gathered church, where men and women, everyone's together, this is not a role that's been given to women. It is a role that's been given to men, and even then, it's only a very small subset, certain men, who have been given this role to teach. And Paul is saying, women, embrace your God-given roles, and that's not one of them. So what should the woman do? Well, a woman should learn. She should be part of the, the gathered community, along with the, most of the men who aren't teachers either, and should be a part of that community learning how she might be a part of what God is doing in the world and what God wants for the world, all people to be saved. She should be learning how she can be a part of that, uh, desiring to see people saved. And flowing out of this, Paul then links this argument in creation, where he says, for Adam was formed first, so that is a Genesis 2 a link, and that is before the fall. In God's good, perfect creation, when God said it is very good, um, Adam was formed first, then Eve, there is a created order, and that's not a belittling thing. Both Adam and Eve were created in God's image. Um, they were created equal, but different. God said to Adam, lead. And he said to the wife, support. But verse 14 refers to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam didn't lead. Adam was there, we're told, in Genesis 3. It says she gave some to the man who was with her when they ate the fruit. Adam was there, but he didn't lead his wife and say, no, don't listen to the serpent. That's not exactly what God said. He didn't lead. So woman took the lead, she was deceived, and she became a sinner. Now that doesn't mean that Adam didn't become a sinner, Adam sinned too. He sinned by not leading, and he sinned by following Eve into uh, this deception of Satan. And the rest, as they say, is history. Ever since uh, sin entered the world, this battle between male and female has been raging. But by linking what Paul says in verse 11 and 12 into the created order, he's saying, look, this isn't up for grabs. Uh, these are roles that God in his goodness and kindness and wisdom has set for both the home, but also for within his church. And a role for the men, certain men, a small subset of men is to be the teachers who exercise authority over the church a God-given authority under the word for the good of the church. And that's not a role that's been given to women. As a part of the community, she must be there learning. If you go and read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, you'll see that women are involved in other parts of the, the church gathered in prophesying and praying and singing. But they aren't given the role of teaching within the gathered church. Women can teach other women. They can teach uh, children, they should be involved in seeing disciples made and disciples matured, but as a part of the gathered church in the formal teaching of the word, which we call the sermon, that is a role that is not given to women, it's given to certain men only. And when you mess that order up, uh, everything goes wrong. So Paul is saying, don't preserve a Genesis 3 order in the church by having women in overall leadership of the church. Genesis 3 was where everything went wrong. So don't preserve that distorted order in the church. A Genesis 2 order of a redeemed and restored order of male leadership is what we should want in the church. It's for the good of the church so that we will be better at seeing this salvation that God wants to go out to the world. We will see that um, happening most effectively if we rejoice in and celebrate the restored, redeemed order within the church. And then another very 
tricky verse that we get to right at the end of this section where he says, but women will be saved, uh, saved through childbearing. What on earth, earth does that mean? If they continue in uh, faith and love and holiness with propriety. Now, faith is also a big theme throughout the letter to Timothy. Um, for Paul says, for all who would believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. So we want to be living lives that point people to Jesus and call them to believe in him. And then Paul says, but a woman will be saved through childbearing. Okay, so we need to understand what does saved mean here. And it can't mean that in some way a woman saves herself because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I think what Paul is talking about here is the idea of working out her salvation, living in the light of her salvation. And through childbearing, I think what Paul is doing uh, with the word childbearing is using it to function as a shorthand way of referring to responsibilities and roles that are particular to a woman. Um, Childbearing is something that only women can do. A man cannot bear a child. And so it's almost like a catch-all phrase to speak of the particular responsibilities for females. And Paul is saying, work out your salvation within the specific roles that God has given to you as you continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Don't try and grab roles that haven't been given to you, but actually it's a beautiful thing for women to work out her salvation within her God-given roles. Now that doesn't only mean having children, but having children is a way to focus it on things that are specifically women only. But as you're teaching women, it's worth encouraging them and saying there are specific ways in which they can serve and minister that no man can ever do and they can do that just because they are female god has created us equal but different and we can use those differences in a way that beautifies the gospel as we point the world to the salvation that jesus came to win And so as you dig in further and teach this to others, keep on reinforcing what a beautiful thing it is for a woman to work out her own roles, her God-given roles, and to do those in a way that points the world around her to Jesus. As she can care and love and serve and disciple in a way that is different to how men do those things. So she, it's a beautiful thing for her to live out the God-given roles that she's been given. And within the church, we really want to redeem uh, the gender roles. In a world with so much confusion and distortion when it comes to gender roles, uh, we want to celebrate our salvation by showing a restored and a redeemed order within the church. And as you continue to dig into this and think further about what it looks like within your church community. I pray that God would give you wisdom and understanding and that you would help both men and women to celebrate the roles that God has given them. In challenging men to man up up, and to lead by praying and lead in the way they live. Uh, Challenging women to embrace the role that God has given them to beautify themselves uh, in the way that they put on good deeds in worship to God, grabbing hold of the roles that God has given them, all for his glory. So God bless as you dig into this passage further.